Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Dotsie Bausch, and I am here with my co-host, Alexandra Paul. Hi, Dotsie. Woo! We are in it. This has <laughs> been a kerfuffle, hasn't it? This corona thing? Yeah. It's crazy town. It's uh, it's scary, for sure. Uh, we're trying to not panic, right? Because that's not going to do us any good. Um, mostly people that have been panicking, it seems like they're mostly concerned with getting caught with a dirty butt at the end of all of this <laughs> with the toilet paper. I, I only have you know, like nine rolls like, left. I don't know if I should have stockpiled. You, you can come over to our house because we actually have a lot. I didn't have to buy any. I had a lot anyway. So You did. Okay. Yeah. But I, it's interesting, isn't it, how we react in times like this? Um, my, I have a twin, as you know, identical twin, and she is all about being prepared. Like, Y2K, she was really prepared. I was pretty prepared, sort of prepared, you know, but not as prepared as she had. She had beans, like <laughs> big, big barrels of beans. For, I don't even know what she ended up doing with them because uh, she didn't eat them. Obviously, Y2K um, worked out. We didn't need to go into our stashes. But I, 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 th I don't see people, I see it as wise to stock up. Right. But I did learn about myself because when my sister lives in San Francisco, then she tells me, okay, well, we're going into sheltering place tonight. <laughs> so that means basically she shouldn't, she's not supposed to leave her house unless necessary. And so Ian and I went to Whole Foods and I immediately went to the chocolate aisle. I immediately went there. I wanted to make sure. I know. It's <laughs> I went to the wine aisle. Is that okay to admit? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. So I think we really learn about ourselves and what we, you know, what comfort or something, or if we use it, food as comfort at all. Yeah, yeah. Other people use toilet paper as comfort, I guess. Clearly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I saw a meme where people are starting to pay with like squares of toilet paper roll, like instead of money because people don't have it. So they, I will start taking payments, I think, in the next week with toilet paper rolls. But it's, a, it's kind of a, an amazing opportunity for people to potentially think about leaning into a plant-based diet. I was in uh, getting my nails done last night. Uh, and Because even in a, yep, a, a, I, an emergency, <laughs> a pandemic situation, we have to look Got to keep right? my hands looking good, right? Super important right now. That's <laughs> funny because I'll just want to tell you one thing. <laughs> I'm like you. I actually got my eyebrows waxed on Sunday. I told Ian, I said, I think when things get <laughs> scary i get vain or something because well, it's, it's self-care so, well it's also it's like, just... i like going to the superficial realm because it makes me feel more comfortable than okay. going into the serious <laughs> people are dying realm god okay so tell me okay, about the nail so salon. now we know a little bit more about each other and so does everyone else out there <laughs> so tell me what happened so in the nail i'm salon. there and, and the... your nails do look fabulous thank you darling way. thank you yes i hope they go to youtube I, I'm everybody like, what if, if i can't get them. there in two weeks from now and it starts growing out and then anyway, that. so the lady next to me uh, who's getting her nails done said, you know, I just went to the grocery store and it's crazy. There's, she specifically said, there's no steaks, there's no chicken, there's really not any, any meat, there aren't any eggs and there's barely any dairy. I don't know what we're going to do. And I just kind of had this reaction where I just thought I'd throw this in and not act like I know everything. And I was like, you know what? Maybe it's time we try that like plant-based diet thing people are starting to talk about. And she's like, really? Do you know much about it? I'm like, yeah, I know a little bit, but I did notice. I said, I went to the grocery store today too. There is no shortage of fresh fruits and vegetables, no shortage of bulk grains, no shortage of nuts and seeds and all of the things they say we should be eating. I'm, I'm going to do it because we don't really have an option. She's like, that is really interesting to think about maybe that that should be the case. So we have an amazing doctor on today that we are going to certainly talk about some of the fears and and not fears of of coronavirus and how at co coronavirus and how it all got started. Um, but I think we can also look at this as a wonderful opportunity for animals, for the planet, for human health. That maybe it's time to try that plant based diet thing. <laughs> I, I didn't know you were such an undercover spy, but I love it. <laughs> yeah, let me tell tell our audience about Dr. Clapper because we are so honored to have him in studio today. Dr. Clapper has 40 years of experience under his belt, and he has seen thousands of patients and helped so many of them heal with a plant-based diet. Dr. Clapper is an author, a researcher, a physician, and he's also a speaker in very high demand. You can you can go, he's all over the, the um, internet because of 
how many uh, talks and interviews that he's done because he's really spreading the plant-based word. He's actually also now touring medical schools around the country to teach preventative medicine and nutrition, which we know is so important. Among, we need to have that uh, in our doctors. So Dr. Clapper is a leader in the plant-based movement. He's been uh, a leader for a long time, and we are so honored to have you here today, Dr. Clapper. It is a delight to be with both of you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. We have, as of today, um, March 16th. It's the morning of March 17th, and we're going to air this next week. So who knows what will be happening in seven days from now. Yeah. Uh, but right now, 5,200 cases <clears throat> known in the U.S. and 94 deaths as of yesterday. Um, and I, I know when this all started snowballing, the first thing that came to my head, because I'm not a catastrophizer at all. I mean, I, I was definitely one of those in the beginning. It was like, oh, please, this will pass. And I was very much intrigued and, and I wanted to know the facts on how are those stats in comparison to the percentage of people who just die every year uh, from the flu, from let's say just even flu A and flu B? And, and, and why is this scarier if it even is? The vast majority of people who get this are going to recover. They're going to feel achy and fluey for a couple of days and run a little grade fever, sore throat. They know they've got a viral infection. And then it passes. And um, so those may drag on for a week or two, but they get through it. And the good news is if it's like all the other viral infections, the person will then be immune. Uh, and so each person who gets it and gets through the other side, uh, there is one less place for the virus to set up housekeeping. And this is how immunity spreads through the population and how epidemics go away. So uh, the folks who get it and, uh, and get through it uh, are the basis for this whole thing fading away. And here's where, uh, unless you're... This is a respiratory virus. Um, it comes in, it's, but it's not a classic pneumonia causing virus where the bronchial tubes get all mucousy and thick and a uh, person gets a classic pneumonia. Uh, this rides in through the bloodstream and the lymphatics, which is one reason they say, don't touch your, your eyes or, or your mouth. What, what happens is that um, it, the virus does wind up in the lungs eventually. People cough into their hands, say, and then they grab a doorknob and transfer the virus to the doorknob and someone comes a few minutes later, grabs the doorknob, gets it on their hands and then rubs their eye. And the virus will get into the bloodstream, into lymphatic channels, ride through the bloodstream and come in through the connective tissue of the lung, around the, the cartilage and the, and the fibrous scaffolding uh, that holds the lung shape. And uh, it, it's not a classic inhaled uh, uh, pneumonia type virus in that way. Uh, and so most folks, uh, especially if you're young, uh, you know, your lungs get a little sore for a few days, but then and you cough, uh, but then it goes away. It hasn't really compromised your ability to breathe, etc. cetera. Um, the problem is in about 20% of folks, as the, as the connective tissue of the lung gets inflamed uh, and swollen and edematous with fluid, uh, it gets stiffer. And so it's just hard to mechanically move those lungs in and out because the scaffolding is stiffer. And uh, so young people don't have a big problem with this, but if you are an old person, say, uh, with congestive heart failure and your lungs are all full of blood and stiff anyway, uh, this will certainly uh, tip you over into trouble. Uh, the folks with emphysema and, uh, and, and asthma who have stiff, uh, damaged lungs, uh, this can really put them in trouble. If you're diabetic and your blood's full of sugar, uh, it's harder for your white blood cells to you know, to combat the germs. And so the diabetic folks can wind up with problems. The older folks, and especially the very, very frail ones, they're the ones as their lungs get stiffer are going to, are going to suffer the worst from this. So um, it, it's no joke, but you're right. Uh, more people do die of influenza. Uh, this thing is so contagious and people can get so sick so fast that they wind up in the emergency room, they wind up in the intensive care unit, and it has the potential for thousands of people with these stiff inflamed lungs piling up in the halls of the, uh, of the hospitals because there aren't enough ventilators and, and ICU beds for them. That's the real horror specter here. Now, but the individual infection itself, you're right, most people are going to get through it and, and it's not going to alter their lives terribly at all. It's going to alter our economy, as it certainly is. Uh, but as, as viruses go, they're, they're, we've seen worse ones and there will be worse ones, unfortunately. 
What about smokers, both cigarettes and marijuana, uh, young people who smoke? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the battle that gets waged in the connective tissue of the lung there, you need healthy lymphocytes, you need healthy uh, mucus, uh, you need uh, healthy antibodies, and all that requires healthy lung tissues. And, and inhaling hot smoke of any kind, uh, tobacco smoke, marijuana smoke, etc. Well, it causes a burn. It causes a low-grade thermal burn, and now your body's busy trying to heal um, burnt lung tissue on the inner lining of the lung. Uh, it's not going to be very efficient in making antibodies against viruses. It's, it's, it's working full time to repair this burn you keep inflicting. So, uh, no, uh, you're absolutely right. The smokers, including the cannabis smokers, uh, wouldn't be surprised if they wind up uh, in respiratory distress because they kind of set the stage for that with their with their inhaling of the hot smoke mm -hmm. i was Less listening more. Mm -hmm. go ahead i was listening to um a briefing um from cottage hospital which is in um up in santa barbara, santa barbara. Mm -hmm. right uh and that that doctor was saying this is just kind of a side note because i was just really interested in this uh fact and maybe this is true with all viruses um but uh, as an athlete, I, I knew a lot about and learned a lot about uh, red blood cells and white blood cells. Uh, you know, just a lot about blood work in general, maybe more than I really needed to know. Uh, and but it, it they said that this virus, people are coming in and it's showing normal white blood cell counts at around, you know, the normal, like around 4000 or something. And I was just curious as to why this virus is or some viruses in general, why your white blood cell count stays the same. But with bacterial infections, it does change significantly, like your white blood cells kind of go on high alert. What, 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 what is the reason for that? Yes, uh, we uh, unfortunately going to get into a little bit of, uh, of uh, technology here, but the uh, we have a number of different types of white blood cells as part of our immune system, and the white cells they're all they're uh, the white cells that are responsible for eating up bacteria, pneumococcus, the, the classic uh, strep bacteria, etc. Uh, they're called neutrophils. They're made in the bone marrow, uh, and they have to physically. Uh, 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 creep up on the bacteria and engulf it and uh, inject peroxides and, and actually kill the bacteria hand-to-hand -hand combat, so to speak. And uh, and in the middle of that pitch battle, the uh, the bone marrow was churning out lots of these white blood cells, you know, bring in the reinforcements, send in the cavalry, and, and classically, uh, white blood cells, the total count goes up 10,000, 12, 15,000 or higher during a rip-roaring uh, lobar pneumonia. You get white counts of 20,000, but these are neutrophils that eat up bacteria. What's happening with viruses is a whole, it's fought on a whole different channel. Um, here, uh, the neutrophils don't react much, but another type of white cell called lymphocytes, uh, which are made by in the bone marrow, but also in the lymph nodes, um, they don't attack the viruses directly. The viruses are way too small. Uh, what the what the uh, neutroph uh, what the lymphocytes do is they start churning out antibody proteins. Uh, they're like this the uh, uh, the uh, anti missile missiles uh, that that uh, uh, seek out the. Uh, uh, the viruses and lock on to them, uh, and uh, and uh, they're taken out of the system uh, by a number of other mechanisms. And you don't need whole lots of numbers of, of lymphocytes. Uh, occasionally, some some uh, viral infections do cause a lymphocytosis, uh, um, mononucleosis, uh, uh, Epstein-Barr virus infections often cause an increased uh, lymphocyte count, but often you don't. But if you look for it, what does go up, of course, is the antibody, the IgG level skyrockets. And, and there's the sign of the battle, not the number of lymphocytes, but the amount of antibody proteins they're putting out. That goes through the roof. And that's the sign of a viral battle going on. So it's a, the difference between the, the two types of white cells that respond to the two different types of infections, bacterial versus viral. Sorry if that was No, a well said. And the analogies yeah. were great. I understood it. Um, so if I understand good. it, I know our very intelligent <laughs> audience is going to get it. Yeah, so I was talking with my husband, Ian, yesterday, and I realized how little I know about contagion because you know how <laughs> you have somebody at, you know, who's come to visit you or at the dinner table and they cough and you, you say, oh, uh, you know, and they say, oh, no, I'm not contagious anymore. I've had it for a week or whatever. How do you know 
when you're contagious and what's the general rule of thumb for contagion for both this virus and um i guess there's a difference you've just elucidated it between bacteria and viruses is the how do we know when we're contagious and not contagious right i wish there was a a little sign lit up on your forehead <laughs> yeah. saying i'm no longer contagious i'm still <laughs> contagious uh, because it's a it's an archetypal ancient question um and our best answer really comes from the chinese experience who you know if we have this tsunami of coronavirus blow through their their hospitals etc and they're faced with the same issue and when do they stop culturing live viruses out of their patients uh how long after they become a asymptomatic when their fever's gone the, the cough is gone the sore throat boy they're talking a minimum of three weeks after symptoms are gone and there's a suspicion that it may drag on way longer than that and uh, so it's going to be a matter of um I suppose, uh, depending on how the test goes, um, is going to be repeated swabs to, until you have two negative swabs at least 24 hours apart. Uh, and then, as I said, anywhere between three weeks when the symptoms have gone, uh, and it may, I wouldn't be surprised if it's six or eight or 10 weeks after that. And, uh, and that's a real issue uh, as far as letting it fade out of the population. It may circulate in a low grade level from people who don't even know they're infected or they think they're over it. And yet they still, when, when they cough or touch surfaces, uh, uh, there might be uh, live viruses there. It's, uh, we've got ourselves in a bit of a pickle here and uh, it's going to take some creativity and perseverance on everybody's part to get through this. It's a matter of keeping yourself healthy. If you get the infection, you want to really uh, let it just be a sore throat and a cough and a fever for a couple of days and, a, and feeling achy. And that means get your body in as good a shape as you can. And here's for that plant-based diet that you mentioned. You want a big fresh salad every day. Uh, keep your immune system uh, spruced up. Get enough sleep. Don't eat sugary junk as a food that lowers your immunity. There you go. Um, I knew going to the chocolate aisle. Put the chocolate away. I got to put the yeah, wine away yeah, too. Yeah, you can have a couple of squares, <laughs> but don't eat, you know, don't eat sugars of big chunks of, of it for food. Um, drink enough water. Have a, have five or six uh, good 16 ounce glasses of water during the day. Keep your secretions thin and keep yourself well hydrated. Uh, and uh, I talk about mushrooms uh, being able to boost your lymphocytes ability to boost their up uh, their uh, immune ability as well as uh, a, a sea vegetable wakame the, the in the green uh, seaweed in the Japanese restaurant salads uh, that seems to help as well but basically get enough sleep drink enough water and the less time you spend out in crowds uh, the better yeah. So now the mushrooms are going to be gone after people hear this <laughs> from the aisles and yeah, and right. the wakami seaweed. Uh, can you expand on that? Are there other foods that people should be eating um, to help protect themselves if they should get in contact with the virus? Because I, I imagine that p there are a lot of people who don't contract anything and might not. Is it possible they might not even pass it along, even if it goes into their body because their body just deals with it right away? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, these lymphocytes uh, are really good at, at, at dissolving viruses. Um, and, I, and I wish I could tell you, you know, um, two sprigs of garlic and a, uh, and, or two cloves of garlic and, and, uh, and uh, a piece of ginger and wear a rutabaga around your neck and you'll be fine. Uh, but I, I can't say there's specific foods that have those kind of antiviral properties to them. You'd be better off, though, um, but, doing that um, than going to Happy Meal, <laughs> for sure. Also, and, and, and you're both athletes. Um, it's, uh, this is also, there's a mechanical conditioning uh, um, uh, aspect to this as far as uh, you don't want to let the virus congest uh, in your lung connective tissue. In other words, go out and take a walk every day. Do some deep breathing. Don't just sit in front of the TV with your chest all crumpled down with that TV remote there and breathing just off the top of your lungs and letting the lymphatic fluid and the blood you know, kind of stagnate in your lungs. That, that's uh, not being wise either there. So uh, even though you're not uh, going out to eat in restaurants, go out and take a walk every day. Get out in the sunshine. Uh, if, if the weather's not good, just uh, sit up straight every couple hours, take three or four deep breaths, do some yoga, uh, do, do some, you know, walk up and down the stairs in your apartment, but stay physically active. That's really important as well. Keep those lungs moving, keep those fluids moving. Right, which also helps with stress management, which is kind of the other piece of this. Indeed. In terms of, 
Yeah, not it's getting enough sleep, but but yeah. people are freaking out, and that's really high stress, right? And that wrecks havoc on your immune system too. We have some um, ideas for in your house workouts, yeah. and then around the block workouts that we just put are out. Are you because you good, do cause yoga? Like, you, you, I imagine your yoga studio is closed. Right? It's not. It's interesting because it's hot yoga, so it's like at 110 degrees, and. Mm. You know, they believe I mean, the virus is yeah, over like over 78 degrees. I don't know. Dr. Clapper probably knows what's just what I've read. So the, it's it's open. They're just only letting 10 people in it per class oh. instead of the normal 50. So we'll see. I don't know. They'll probably close it tomorrow. But it, right now yeah. it's open because it's hot yoga. Mm. I don't know. But Dust, you brought up such an important point about stress. Uh, it's it's not a theoretical uh, concern. Uh, when we are under stress, our adrenal glands put out this hormone called cortisol, and cortisol suppresses your immune system's ability to respond. It makes it harder for the lymphocytes to put out antibodies. It's not good to walk well with high cortisol levels, and uh, we generate them with uh, as we generate stress in our heads. And uh, and this the we are on the front end of a of a very stressful time here, and there's going to be all sorts of impositions in our lifestyles and our finances, where worries about the future, uh, and little things can become big things. And this is a time to really go out of our way not to let that happen. Let little stuff go on a slide right on by. You know, if somebody didn't do the dishes in the sink, just do the dishes and you know, don't make a big deal over it. Uh, I've really raised my threshold over things that I get upset about at this point. So it's mostly small stuff. And, uh, and my job is to make the people around me feel at ease and comfortable and loved and not judged and helped. And, and the issue is, is when you walk in a new situation, how can I help? What, what needs to be done here? What, what can I do? And, and that's the kind of attitude, you know, love in the time of coronavirus, you know, instead of cholera. Uh, but uh, uh, so and all this comes and doubles back on the stress issue that you raise up. There's time to generate as little stress and as much love as possible. Yeah. With Americans being um, more obese than those in Asia and generally having worse health overall, um, how is that, do you feel, going to affect? Because not, and I'm not just talking lungs like we discussed earlier, but they did mention obesity and underlying conditions. I'm just wondering about Americans are much less healthy than their counterparts oh, in, in uh, yeah. China. Yeah, it's a very perceptive uh, question, though. I, I hear obesity is going up in China, too, as Western uh, food infiltrates over there. Uh, but obesity is not a state of health, uh, the, despite what some people kid themselves about. Obesity is a state of inflammation. Uh, uh, what makes that big abdominal girth uh, bulge out so much is that in the abdomen, I've seen lots of them open, the um, the uh, intestines in, in the abdominal cavity are wrapped in intra-abdominal fat, and this is not inert stuff. Uh, the uh, the intra-abdominal fat puts out these very powerful molecules called inflammatory cytokines, and they set off inflammation throughout the body. And uh, obesity is a state of inflammation, and that in, to, uh, in turn doubles back and inhibits your immune system. If, you, if your body is constantly percolating a, a low grade of inflammation in your tissues uh, and, and in, your, in your immune cells, in your bone marrow, etc., it's just not going to be efficient at marshalling uh, a, a very targeted, mild, but effective inflammatory reaction uh, against the viruses and the uh, and, and any damage that, that they might be producing. Um, the, the last thing, obesity blurs the signal um, as far as the body being efficient uh, in its defenses. Plus, it makes you more diabetic and it's going to raise your blood sugar and, and high blood sugars uh, interfere with your white blood cells. All the way around, obesity is not a state of health, uh, that's for sure. And as we mentioned, uh, if you've got a, a large amount of abdominal fat, that's pushing up underneath your diaphragms and the lungs just cannot move as well. It's difficult for obese people to ventilate their lungs and that is not in your favor with a respiratory virus. You want those lungs moving, you want lots of blood and lymph circulating through them. So all the way around, obesity uh, is not a uh, good combination with this coronavirus, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. 
let's talk then about yeah let's dive in a little bit to um well where this came from and understanding where it came from and and uh i i had a a a friend that i've known for years through cycling uh send me this meme like three days ago and it was a picture of the grocery store shelves and it all all the meat and dairy was gone and then it was you know all of the quote vegan food uh was completely stocked and it said even in emergency people don't want to eat vegan food (laughs) and so uh you know i wrote back and i said well maybe if we ate more vegan food we wouldn't have any more of these pandemics uh happening because we we mostly know from all of the reading that i've done that it probably came for a from a bat or a cat in the wuhan wet market in china which a wet market is a live slaughter market uh and so uh it is as you, as one could imagine a bacterial bloodbath through the streets um and and the sidewalks and people are walking through it and then they're walking in their house and so they're just carrying all this um really contagious materials that say around um and he you know said back to me when i said maybe we should kind of look at what we're eating as a whole if we didn't eat any more animal agriculture and as we know many people that eat meat have animals in all sorts of categories and he goes well yeah but it came from a disgusting bat in a gross market in china and i was like okay they eat bats and cats we eat cows and chickens we kill them the same way whether it's people can see it or not see it yeah it's just it's as a blood mac- bath and it has tons of bacteria just as much bacteria yeah. breeding and all of um as you mentioned earlier to me before this all of the kind of known uh pandemics have originated in animal agriculture, swine flu, bird flu, H1N1, um, yep. Ebola. I'm Mad sure Dr. Cow Clapper. You, yeah, exactly. Um, they, so uh, what, what? Please comment. Help. <laughs> I mean, it's just, yes. yeah. You, you are, uh, you know, you've put your finger on it. Let me fill in some, uh, uh, some reality details here. Um, we seeing the, uh, epidemiology of how this is spread, we can rewind the clock and, and see here we are in March, probably six months, last September, October in the Wuhan uh, city wet market. Um, they have bats, uh, they have live bats and, and dead ones. Um, and the bats, uh, people go into the cave and they either take them off the wall during the daytime or they trap them in nets. These bats are filled with viruses. A bat cave is, is plastered with bat guano that, that uh, the bats pass back and forth. The uh, bat saliva, bat urine uh, is full of these really aggressive viruses. And uh, but because you know, I'm sure for the last thousand years, you know, stewed bats have wound up in 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 traditional stews or whatever. But it's time to, like so many other things, to leave that behind. But we to leave meat eating behind in general well because i mean you just just to just to clarify is that they put it in a stew but it was maybe you know 20 people and then it didn't spread those people didn't travel and so now let me right i think it was a slightly different scenario here's what i think happened so they gather these poor bats up uh they put them in these cages uh they they defecate on the pangolins and other animals below it and then then uh that they become secondary hosts but on but sometime last september uh, a a man or woman working in the market reach in grab the live or dead bat put it on the chopping block spread its wings out and went to butcher the bat because somebody wanted it, it cut up for for stew and when that cleaver came down and it's and it split the carcass in half um the blade went right through the bladder and the abdomen and when that happened a spray of bat urine and bat feces went all over got on the man or woman's face and she wiped her face uh, and she went, went like this and inhaled the the bat urine droplets and that's when it rode through her circulatory lymphatic system got into her lungs she went home started coughing she she or he uh became patient zero and and we now see the result of that and when that cleaver came down human history changed with that stroke uh, and and this is how interconnected we are and how that oh and dirty bat well there it, it's a message from the bats and uh, that we are not your food and uh, we are uh, it's time to stop eating all these poor animals 
and uh, but but this is uh, you know the bad the the these confinement operations, no matter what the animal is, when you combine, when you confine a hundred thousand pigs or chickens or geese or sheep, whatever it is, are going to spread these nasty diseases and breed these viruses that go back and forth. And as you rightly said, Alexandra, um, H one N one is is a swine a swine virus, uh, and and it killed a whole bunch of people in this country, and and we and we're certainly breeding that. Uh, fetid uh, disease producing process uh, here in America in our confinement operations. So uh, this is now those dirty Chinese we, 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 we create the very same problems here. And so it's just a matter of time before a cattle virus or, or, or a pig virus you know jumps out uh, and causes this havoc. This is all a message from the animals that the age of animal eating is over. We are not your food. You are plant eating simians, hum humans. Eat your rice and beans and greens and fruits and vegetables. Leave us alone. Don't come into the caves and, and, and pluck us off the walls. You know, we're not your food. Uh, eat plants and you'll be healthy. What would you say to the American who says, but it's different for us? We have our our farms are cleaner, the way we kill them are cleaner after they're packaged in a more clean way, et cetera. How, how would you? you right. But one, they're not. Um, they're, these animals are fed hundreds and thousands of pounds of, of potent antibiotics here in America uh, as growth promoters. And as a result, uh, this, the, the confinement operations, the slaughterhouses are breeding these hellaciously antibiotic resistant bacteria. We're going to start seeing salmonella and streptococcus and, and pseudomonas and shigella that are I'll tell you as a doctor, work in the emergency room, nothing was scarier than having uh, a culture report come back from the microbiology lab for someone with a pneumonia, and they test to see which antibiotics uh, the bacteria is susceptible to, and you just see a whole row of R, 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 R is for resistant, resistant R, 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 all the antibiotics are listed, there is an R next to every one of them, because we've used those antibiotics uh, as growth promoters uh, in the slaughterhouse, and uh, and so we're, we're breeding the, our American style of microbiologic apocalypse uh, in, in our, the, the way we're doing the, uh, uh, the mass uh, uh, flesh production facilities. Uh, and as I said, uh, H1N1 was a, was a swine virus, and, and yeah, there's no reason that it can't uh, come up out of the Smithfield uh, hog um, operations that are in North Carolina that wind up in everybody's uh, basement every time there's a hurricane uh, and, and all that, uh, that swine manure goes all over. Well, it's going to carry its nasty viruses next, you know, the next hurricane or two. Uh, we cannot be complacent about this. We are violating natural law no other animal does this to, to other animals and and uh, and we're reaping them the microbiologic whirlwind uh, that comes off of violating natural law like we're doing this and we're not meat eaters to begin with we are we have don't have claws on our hands we have fingers we have the grinding molar teeth and long intestines we're plant eating creatures like the our gorilla and bonobo cousins and we ought to be eating basically the same fruits and leaves that they're eating and uh, we're meant to do to, to eat plants and, and we, we, it's time to start honoring that uh, and that's what this is really a whole uh, really the message that we have to uh, to open to but ooh, we don't want to hear that uh, but now the veggie burgers are gotten so good it's not even that big a sacrifice <laughs> it I do certainly isn't. I do wonder though if people really are going to learn why because Americans aren't we're not great at asking why no they're not uh, no. when 9 11 not... happened we didn't really think why did this happen we didn't back up really nope. far to figure it out so that it wouldn't happen again and we wouldn't have uh, we still are afraid of terrorism today uh, 20 years later um, and so we never really got to the root of the issue and I worry that it's going to yeah. be the same way with this is that we're not really going to change our ways and really recognize the consumers are not going to recognize it I can understand why the farmers mm -hmm. might resist but mm -hmm. 
Um, You're right. For for smart creatures, we are slow learners. You know, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it's Stubborn. we can identify a genetic mismatch on gene A21 on chromosome 14. Boy, we can hone in on that with precision. <laughs> but the thought that eating cheeseburgers and pizzas might be clogging up our arteries and that confining animals breeds viral diseases. This we well, we don't want to look at that. You know, it's, we're we're some creature and I Homo know. sapiens, funny funny species. I wanted to ask you just a question to go, uh, on the R R R R the resistant ba uh, yeah. bacteria that was in the patient. Is that specific more apt to happen in patients who've eaten a lot of meat, or have we just changed the entire culture, no pun intended, so that everybody has these resistant antibiotics, even if they've mm -hmm. been this resistance to antibiotics, even if they've been vegan for decades? Oh, fascinating question. Um, there, there's a lot of subtle gradations uh, in that, but um, uh, the more meat you eat, there's no question it changes the microbiome in your gut. Uh, and if your immune system then goes down, if you wind up on immunosuppressant drugs for your psoriasis or for your uh, for your Crohn's disease, or you develop a leaky gut, you've got some nasty antibiotic bacteria already poised to get out in the bloodstream. Um, uh, these folks are, uh, I think, statistically at much higher risk for developing these nasty antibiotic-resistant infections. Uh, no, no question, and we're going to be seeing more and more. And they go, oh, where did it come from? It came from the chickens. It came from the pigs. Is, is where where it came from. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we love to um, spend a little bit of time going into your journey and and then your incredible work that you do today. Why you're doing it? How it's helping people? How it's changing so many people's and animals' lives? Uh, you went vegan in your early 30s, right? Yes. Is that mm -hmm. okay? Um, mm -hmm. And in doing research, we read that you became passionate about um, nonviolence when you were dealing with a lot of patients in medical school in Chicago who had been victims of violence. Uh, mm -hmm. And you started to read um, books and spiritual books on nonviolence. Um, and you you told a friend over a steak dinner, I think, or I know it was an, an animal based right. dinner. Yeah. Steak dinner. Um, okay, uh, and, and the fr and you were you were speaking to him about about this uh, non non violence and and what you were learning and and what you were researching, and he said, "Well, you might just go ahead and start with that meat on your plate, mm -hmm. in in terms of re removing violence." So you transitioned then to veganism gradually. Um, t t tell us about that that evening and what um, happened in your in your heart, in your mind, in your soul when that friend said that to you. Sure. Uh, well, I had done much of my growing up on my uncle's dairy farm in northern Wisconsin, and I knew uh, like we all do, uh, we push down, we, we can totally suppress, but I knew the violence inherent in getting meat on the plate. I saw the little dairy cow shot in the head when they stopped giving me giving milk. I chopped the heads off chickens myself. I, I know the inherent violence in putting any kind of meat on the plate and dairy as well. Uh, I see the, the truth of that industry. Uh, but we suppressed that, you know, that chicken, fried chicken tasted good in my teenage years. I didn't want to think about you know, the chickens. And I didn't want to think about the cows in, in, in the dairy barn, uh, but I but I knew it. And then when the uh, when my friend pointed out that in, in satisfying my desire for the taste of flesh in my mouth, I'm paying for the death of the animal and for the next one in line at the slaughterhouse. And as soon as he said that, all my head came up with all the old rationalization. Well, that's what they raised them for. Uh, the animal's dead already. But before those words could come out of my lips, the, the little voice in my head said, you know, he's right. He's right. Because uh, I knew uh, the reality of putting that meat on the table. And when I went up to pay for the dinner, I felt complicit in a crime when I put that $20 bill down on the table. And, uh, and I knew in my heart that my meat eating days were over. And uh, it didn't take long uh, before uh, a week or two later, I, I had been raised in a Jewish household after World War II, and I saw the uh, the pictures of the lampshades made of the skins of the Jews and, uh, and all of that. And I was putting on my leather shoes a few days after the steak dinner, and the leather and my leather belt and my leather wallet, it felt absolutely cadaverous. 
And so I went out back of uh, the house and I dug a hole and I put my leather shoes there, my leather belt, my leather wallet, and I buried my leather and I filled in the hole. And I stepped back, I apologized to the animals. I didn't know, but now I know. Uh, and the era of hemp wallets and, and, and now leather shoes began. Uh, but um, it just felt better. I, I just didn't want to have the leather on me any longer. And a couple of weeks later, I mentioned to a friend who what the evolution I had gone through, and she says, oh, you've you become a vegan. I had never heard the word, but it was 1981. Uh, okay, I guess I have. And I haven't looked back since. There, there's no, Once you look behind the curtain, you can't pretend you don't know what's behind the curtain. You know, well, once, once you see the truth of it all, there's no, there's no place to run and, and still have a good night's sleep. There, there's no, the animals are always looking. My conscience is always looking. And, uh, and my heart's always looking. So yeah. uh, I've been a vegan ever since. Go and ahead. you, uh, as a doc we know didn't get a lot of training in uh, medical school no. on uh, plant nutrition. And so I get asked all the time, and I'm sure you do, and I, I, I want to hear what you first dove into, you know, right when you made the switch uh, and you said, okay, no more. What, what did you start doing? What was the first right. couple of things you did? What did you eat? Where did you find it? Because it sounds a little bit overnight there that this, this happened, right. you know, right? This wasn't over two years. This was over maybe a weeks or something. Um, yes. What did you learn? How did you figure out what you're going to eat? Because that's everybody's conundrum. Like, okay, maybe yeah. I'm going to do this, but what do I eat? Good question. Good question. Uh, it was 1981, not a lot of support, I agree, but uh, I was, I got the big message from my heart in that, in that restaurant, but I was getting another message in the operating room. I was a resident in anesthesiology, and I was on the cardiovascular anesthesia service, and every day I'm putting people to sleep, and I'm watching surgeons open their chest and open their coronary arteries and pull this yellow guck out of their arteries, which was now very well known. It's largely the fat of the animals uh, these people are eating. Uh, there was already reports in the medical journal that you can melt this stuff away with a plant-based diet. Uh, and my dad that was already showing signs of clogged arteries that would eventually kill him. He was already having angina. And uh, and I knew I, I had the genes for it. I'm going to be one. If I don't change, I'm going to be on that operating table with that striker saw going up my sternum. And I sure didn't want that to happen. So I, so that was another avenue of, of messaging that I was getting. So between the two, I said, well, what am I going to eat? Uh, now, first of all, I was in Vancouver. It's a great eating city. Uh, and I, I'd already been a big fan of Indian food. And I knew in the Indian restaurants, it's not hard to get a, to get a, a vegetarian meal. And uh, I got uh, bean tortillas in the, uh, in the Mexican restaurant. And the Chinese food was, was easy, and uh, and I ate a lot of Indian and Chinese and Mexican food for uh, because I was a bachelor at the time, uh, and uh, but my body loved it within. 12 weeks, a 20 pound spare tire of fat melted off my waist. My high blood pressure came to normal. My high cholesterol came down to normal. And I felt great waking up in a nice lean light body every day. And uh, so uh, there, there was no going back at that point. And at that point I realized I didn't want to be an anesthesiologist and spend my career putting people to sleep. I'd rather go back to general practice and help them wake up, right? And That's so I great. did. And, uh, <laughs> So I went back to general practice, uh, moved down to Florida, and um, and started having my patients adopt a similar diet, found people in the neighborhood to give plant-based cooking classes. And my patients had the same experience. They lost weight. Their high blood pressure came down. Their diabetes got better. They turned into normal, healthy people right in front of our eyes. And, there, and I became a plant-based doc uh, from that point on. I'm the happiest doctor I know because my patients get healthier. <laughs> and so uh, medicine's been a lot of fun. But it's a matter of bringing that message to my colleagues at this point. And that's, uh, that's what I'm devoting the rest of my career to. Because, as you say, we, we get no uh, training in nutrition. We don't have respect for the subject. And the reality is, and I tell these young docs and these young medical students, when you open the door of the waiting room in, in your office or in the emergency room, you're not going to be seeing people with leprosy and smallpox. It's going to be obesity and diabetes and clogged arteries from what your patients are eating. It's, it's not etiology unknown. This is what happens with the American diet, when bacon and eggs and cheeseburgers and pizzas and egg McMuffins through the bloodstream hour after hour, year after year you're going to wind up with a body that's clogged up and inflamed and diabetic and hypertensive and, and ill. And, and 
let's get real about that. And you need to know, I tell the young first, second, third year med students, that you put these people on a whole food plant-based diet, run lots of salads and soups and rice and beans and greens and fruits and veggies through them for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. And the change, the transformation is stunning. Within days, the obesity starts to melt away and the arteries open up and the high blood pressure comes down and the joints stop hurting and the asthmatic lungs stop wheezing so much and the migraine headaches go get better and the psoriatic skin clears up and the, and the colitis gets better and they turn into normal, healthy people. And I tell them, isn't what, you know, why'd you go into medicine? You want to heal these people or don't you? If you do, this is the most powerful transformation you can offer. It's unethical to withhold this information from our patients. And you need to know this. Because if you're just going to see them back once a month and raise their statin dosage and raise their metformin dosage and they come back in a month and not get real with them about why they're sitting in front of you, obese and diabetic and hypertensive and inflamed, then you're not practicing complete medicine. You want to heal these patients, then get real, then find a plant-based dietitian in the neighborhood, send send the patient to her, let her do the counseling, let her show them the videos, let her take them shopping, and see them back in a month, see if they'll be healthier, which they will be. This is how medicine should be practiced. And the students are very open to this message. It's a hopeful message. And uh, our uh, 501c3 uh, uh, institution is called Moving Medicine Forward. If people are interested, uh, they can go to my website, drclapper.com, and click on Moving Medicine Forward and see what we're doing. We could show you some help uh, with uh, plane tickets, et cetera. And as soon as the, uh, as soon as the uh, corona tsunami passes through, uh, I'll be back at the medical schools. But, but it has also given me a window to get this all online so we can do a national dialogue on nutrition-based cases with these young students. So we're using the time, and uh, we can still use the support. So long-winded answer, but... Uh, to, we can't ignore what our patients are eating. It, it's just, it, it's unethical to do that. And it's exciting if we pay attention to it. Well, thank you for that work because it's so important and you're, you're uh, multiplying exponen- exponentially all the knowledge that you've gathered by imparting it to other doctors who will then go tell their many, many patients. Um, right. So that's, that's such an amazing legacy. Amazing. Yes, each each doctor is going to treat you know thousands of patients in their careers, and if we can reach them while they're young, and then plant based nutrition will cure your patients. But most of them know that uh, that would change the face of American medicine. That's just what we're trying to do, and make a lot of healthy people along the way. Well, one of the reasons that um, doctors feel tell me if I'm wrong, you're a doctor and you talk to doctors. So you, I know you know better than I, but my impression has been is that they only get, they get so little time and they don't trust that their patients will change truly. And they feel, and patients expect to have a cure right away is that, and the doctors feel pressure to say, to give them an answer. Um, is this true? Is this what you're hearing? Oh, is it, what is the resistance? And, and there's tremendous resistance. The students are very open to this, but it's the professors standing in the back of the room with their arms folded saying, oh, people, are, they're never going to change. They're never going to stop eating their burgers because the doctors aren't. Is you know, One reason the doctors are eating it themselves and they're eating the burgers and the peaches and the steaks and the lobsters. They tell their patients not to eat it. But then you wind up with doctors with big pot bellies and a, and a and a pocket full of statins and beta blockers, and that's no example to set for our patients. Um, but, what, but what about the uh, patients? Uh, you know, will, will they change? Yeah. Um, it's easier. It's getting easier. Uh, certainly, in the, it's easier for me among my colleagues. In, in every first, second, third year medical school class I go see now, there's um, – there's 20 or 30 students who've seen films, they've seen Forks Over Knives, they've seen What the Hell, they've seen Game Changers, the, the light's on, and uh, you know, it's not 1980 any longer. And um, so thank you to everyone who produced and appears in those films, they, they is made my job a whole lot easier. But so, so the patients, a lot of them are open, they know somebody who's known somebody who knows somebody who changed their diet and, and got better. 
Uh, but I say, but I tell the young docs, listen, even if you don't believe this yourself, you at least owe the patient a, a three-page handout on the way out as they're go, leaving your office and going out there. By the way, you want to get rid of your diabetes here. Uh, you want to get rid of your high blood pressure here. Go to these websites, uh, see these videos, read this book, see, call this dietitian. She'll, she'll help you. You at least owe them the information that it exists, whether or not you do it yourself. So that's square one. But um, but I invite them uh, to uh, to do it themselves for a couple of weeks. You know, if they have any medical issues, uh, how it's like to get rid of your you know and fill in the blank there as far as what what problem they've got because it's probably going to get better on, on a whole food plant based diet. So we need to just get that foot in the door, and that's why I'm, I'm want to talk to the young med students before pharmacosclerosis sets into their brains and they think that uh, the drugs are the only treatments for these these uh, maladies that are caused by what they're eating and so it's uh, you know it's a uh, balancing act it's a battle it's a struggle but it's the only one worth fighting for me at this point uh, I really my legacy I want to be that I helped my beloved profession wake up to what our patients are eating as a cause of their disease and the key to their healing. If I can uh, uh, get American medicine tuned into that and in Western medicine in general, I'll say mission accomplished. But we got a long way to go. What, if, what uh, so some people say, oh, I tried being a vegan and I didn't feel good. And you mm -hmm. did a study on this and uh, mm -hmm. had some thoughts about it. What, what do you tell right. people when they say yeah. that to you? Right. Um, it's possible. You know, at, at age, we're, we're funny creatures, we homo sapiens. At age six months uh, of, of age, the baby's still nursing at the breast. And with all the love in the parents' hearts, your mother didn't know, my mother didn't know, but with all the love in their hearts, at age six months, that jar of a baby lamb and baby chicken and baby turkey is opened. And at that point on, three times a day, animal flesh is slathered on that child's intestinal tract, all through infancy, uh, toddlership, child, uh, all through their childhood, um, adolescence, their teen years, three times a day, they're eating their fast food burgers and the, and the pizzas and the chicken and the and the beef, and we uh, we make these children consume a flesh-based diet. Well, you eat a flesh-based diet three times a day through for twenty years, thirty years, forty years. You'll become dependent upon the muscle-based nutrients, the, on the flow of carnitine, creatine, uh, uh, substances from the animal's muscles that we make ourselves. But if it's coming in preformed three times a day in the food, since childhood, your genes are going to downregulate. You may not be able to make your own as enough carnitine or creatine or myoglobin or whatever animal-based nutrient uh, uh, that you should be making. Uh, and, and so you develop a dependency on it because it's, it's always in the bloodstream. But then if you suddenly adopt a plant-based diet, most folks gear up their enzymes and their genes and they, they can pick up their own carnitine synthesis. But a significant number of folks uh, might take them uh, six weeks or three months to, to really gear up their enzymes. And during that time, they draw down on their own stores of, of uh, muscle-based nutrients, and they don't feel so great. And then they eat a piece of meat, and all that preformed uh, animal nutrients flows through them, and they become dependent upon. And they say, oh, I feel great, vegan, schmegan, man, I need my meat. But what do we witness? This is not normal human physiology. This is an acquired dependency that was created by feeding a human infant animal flesh three times a day since infancy. Um, you know who doesn't get meat cravings? People have been raised as vegans since birth. I've delivered a couple dozen of them in my career, and I watched them grow up to big, strong, healthy people um, with, with bright minds and, and healthy bodies, and they don't have meat cravings. Their mouths don't water when they walk past the barbecue. They are different physiologic creatures. We are not carnivorous apes. We, we, do, we do not have a natural requirement for animal flesh, and 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 most folks are, are do quite well on a completely plant-based diet. But those folks, to uh, come back to your question, the folks who are saying, I, I didn't do well and then I needed I need some meat, yeah, they were probably telling the truth. They probably did have a dependency on this. And some folks may have to taper off 
uh, they, they may have to do a gradual transition. They may, do, as they make their transition, uh, if they're that dependent on it, they may need to eat a small amount of animal flesh once a week uh, for, you know, X number of weeks and then stretch out the interval between it as their enzymes gear up. And it might take them three months, six months, a year to taper off uh, getting off their meat-based diet. They've been eating it for 40 years. Uh, it might take them, you know, 6, 12, 18 months to taper off. That's okay, as long as the majority of food that goes down their gullet is whole plant foods. If there's a little bit of uh, animal food there, uh, rarely, uh, if it helps them keep their balance, uh, I'm, I, I don't have a problem with that. Why are um, creatine and carnitine so addictive, as opposed to all of the other elements of meat? We've heard you speak about that before. Why are they so addictive for people? Well, um, carnitine in particular is involved in get, harvesting the energy out of fat. Uh, it helps move uh, fatty acids into the mitochondria to, to be burned for, for energy. And, and if, if there's a relative carnitine deficiency and you don't uh, are, aren't able to tap into the, uh, the ATP production from the fat, uh, then you're, you're going to feel depleted. You're going to not feel that you've got the muscular strength that you want. But again, uh, vegan athletes, as you will personify, and uh, and certainly the uh, uh, folks who've been raised as vegans since birth, um, not an issue to them. Uh, and we're talking just a. The, the folks who, and this is all my theory, I, you know, I, this has to be proven in a laboratory, but as far as what are we looking at, those folks who do, don't do well on a completely vegan diet to, to start with and do better with some meat in their diet, they must have some kind of dependency on it. And the most likely substances are, are carnitine and creatine. But I'm using that as a shorthand. There's probably hundreds of, of animal muscle-related nutrients that flood into the tissue with every beef burger and every every chicken breast. Uh, and and I could see that each may have some role to play in muscle metabolism, etc. And when you go vegan and suddenly stop that, now the person may miss that particular nutrient X or whatever it might be. It may not be carnitine or creatine. I'm just using it as a, a placeholder for for the all for the animal based nutrients that we get dependent upon by eating a flesh based diet since infancy. Uh, that really is not our natural food. Now you talk about what to eat and you you have the four S's. Can you talk a little bit about those? Mm -hmm. Right. As far as uh, this is off my handout, I just want to make it as simple as possible uh, for, for again, for Joe, meat and potatoes guy, Doc, what do I eat? What do I eat? Um, so I said, well, think of the four S's. Yeah. Well, for breakfast, if, you, if you're not hungry, just drink water till you get hungry. But, but, uh, but if you are hungry, uh, oatmeal and fruit works just fine or just the fruit alone uh, and, uh, that makes for a nice solid breakfast. But lunches and dinners, I said, think about the four S's. You walk into the, into the kitchen. What, what, how do I put together a dinner? How do I put together lunch? Four S's, soup, salad, steamed veggies and starches. And so, um, uh, so salads, uh, you should, everybody should have a big salad going in the fridge all the time and just, you know, take some out and come up with a no oil dressing over there. So salad should be part of at least, you know, at least once a day, you want a big fresh salad. Twice a day is even better, lunch and dinner. But uh, so first that's the salad. Second, I'm a big fan of hearty vegetable soups. Got to break out the crock pot and, and make up the dynamite uh, vegetable soup. You can buy frozen vegetables all cut up, organic ones at the, the supermarket. People say, I don't want to spend all day cutting and chopping. You don't have to open up a bag of cut up organic veggies and throw them in the pot. Uh, throw in a couple of rice, a couple of beans, a couple of lentils, whatever, whatever you'd like. Uh, season it however you want and uh, let it cook during the day or, or overnight. And you got this big pot of soup every time you walk through the kitchen and ladle out a cup and, and enjoy it. Um, uh, I'll take uh, about half of it and pour it into Tupperware plastic containers and, and let them cool. Put a lid on them and put them in the freezer. Now you got a bunch of frozen soup portions there to bring out and, and heat whenever you don't want to, to cook. So soups are a, a big part of a healthy plant-based uh, diet plan. Uh, salad soups, um, steamed veggies. Uh, the only cooking you need to do is know how to use a vegetable steamer. You want something green and something yellow pretty much every day. You want something green, kale, char, Brussels sprout, broccoli, asparagus, bok choy, anything dark and green. A nice helping of that once a day. And something yellow, orange, carrots, squash, sweet potatoes, uh, yams. Uh, green and yellow, green and yellow are the, your watchword colors there uh, to put together a healthy meal. 
and then some kind of starch for calories, whether it's a whole grain. With I'm a big fan of quinoa and millet and buckwheat. Um, uh, they got to deal with the arsenic and the rice these days, but there's uh, there's non-rice uh, grains, uh, and find a way to get some kind of legume. It doesn't start with S, but uh, they're they are just protein bananas. So anything in a pot is a legume: beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils. So uh, so have a lentil stew or bean burrito, a hummus sandwich, something with with uh, legumes um, frequently during the week. If you do that, lunches and dinners just fall together. And as I said, you make up a big pot of soup, you can eat off of it for three days. And uh, so you just have to cook like twice a week, use your freezer. And again, the more you do it, the easier it gets. And have fun with all the all the cuisines, all the Italian and Chinese and East Indian and Mexican and Thai. It's, uh, there's no end of ways to entertain your tongue with plant-based uh, cuisine. And no end and, of flavor. Uh, with all yes, of those different really. types of and, cuisines. And you know, all. the big sacrifice, we're asking people to choose the bean chili instead of the beef chili. Yep. You know, it's, a, it's not that big a sacrifice, but it makes all the difference in the world, literally. Yeah. So we're still good. If you li- have ever listen to this podcast, you know that Alexandra and I are potato heads. We will eat <laughs> potatoes, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, yeah. just yeah. whole potatoes, yeah. <laughs> chip Count and garlic sauce. I can sauce live and... on potatoes and greens. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yay. <laughs> Well, yeah. you're, you know, you're making a world of difference and I'm just so impressed with how you're spreading the word through doctors. It's just genius. And, um, thank you so much. We're going to put in the show notes about your program so that people can go there and support you and learn more about it. Um, but I just, Dotsie and I want to thank you from the bottom of this our heart outstanding for coming on oh. the show. Thank you. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. You are such great ambassadoresses for uh, for sanity and for love and for uh, for the animals and for uh, for sustainability on this planet. So thank you for setting the example and getting the word out. We're all we're all on the same team. We're we the sure are, planet. especially times like this. So indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Corona. Mm. You're so welcome. Thank you, guys. All the best. Bye bye. And to your to your listeners. Bye bye. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.